on today's episode of the Bubs and Teabag Show. The guys solve a multitude of world problems. I could be a dictator for a day. I could for maybe a week, two yeah, weeks. I, I, I think need, two weeks. I'd like a good eight months. Bubs tells Teabag precisely where he can put his opinion. And this was just the fancy, shiny object in his slick talking. He's a huckster. Huh? And Teabag gives a sermon on the current state of affairs. Hey, you want tickets to the Met Gala? Which is this disgusting sort of ritual that these upper crust elites in New York City and Hollywood types go to and perform, you know, some type of weird seance that has to do with child sacrifice. But in reality, what they're saying is, hey, this is just a really big fundraiser (laughs) and everybody's dressed up in the hottest fashions. All this and ice cream sundaes coming up. Yeah. Check the licks, Bubs. Those are great. Good gets, songs. Gets me every time. Right? Every time. Never gets old. Yeah. Man, we're starting early today. Every uh, every day earlier, and I don't mind it. You know what I mean? It's uh, the best part of waking up is Bubs in your cup, as they say. You know, uh, you kind of get the morning radio pipes. <sighs> I, I think we do sound better a little bit in the AM. You know what I mean? My and... voice right now is very penetrating. <laughs> James Earl Jones kind of is the vibe I was getting. Sure. Um, yeah. I also think that this cup of this steaming cup of Joe, out of my new Golden Girls coffee mug, is helping you know the morning kind of go along, so to speak. Have you got off that website of Silver Daddies and moved over to Silver Mamas? <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, lot of great like sort of action pics of B. Arthur back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big fan of it. That you know? flowing kind of loose. Pre-internet, you know, where it was, it was no JPEGs or anything like that. It was all film. Maybe just some grainy Polaroids. Yeah, yeah, the sort of Victoria's uh, Secret type, you know, hidden snaps. The boudoir, I believe, is what they call that. Sure. What have you done in the last week, buddy? Uh, interesting story is uh, the last time we we spoke like this, it was my birthday. Yep, that was a fun one. Did uh, did you tie it on that night? I did, a little bit. Later, though, it was weird. It got later. We had uh, some people over, uh, grilled out some steaks. But uh, right before I was going to fire up the grill, our neighborhood went on lockdown with cops that locked down the neighborhood and set up a perimeter because they were looking for a dude that was running. Was it you? (laughs) No, no. This guy decided to park at the end of our block and take off running. What a nice guy, you know, to do that on your birthday, of all things. Well, you know. It was interesting to watch the development of the local law enforcement set up their perimeter and get the dog. Free entertainment type thing? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Did they catch the the uh, the, the perp? Eventually, they caught the perp. Yeah? Yeah. They rough him up a little bit, I hope? Uh, I suggested that yeah. from my backyard. Yeah, right. But uh, no, they got him, I guess, around the corner. You know, I don't know. He was like two blocks down hiding something. They garage. did things by the book. It appeared to be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well... Thank God for those police out there in the western suburbs that uh, did something. Or eastern suburbs, I guess. Northeastern. Or wh- wherever yeah. the hell it is. Yeah, up there somewhere. Yeah. No, it, it was nice. It that was... doesn't fly here in Mille Lacs County, Bubs. What, what's that? Runners? <clears throat> they catch you here? Yeah, you're going to get it a little one-two. Yeah, yeah. You're going to get a uh, little, the the little bit of the old little bit of the old how's your father, so yeah. to speak, type S- thing. Stop resisting. Yeah. 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 And I don't, you know, and, and also... You got the Rum River over here, and from what I understand, they're not afraid to throw a man in it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Don't yeah. take me to the river. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're not afraid to leave you in the river. Mm-hmm. Um, well, justice is justice. You know, the Rum River is kind of good, though. I mean, uh, there's a lot of... During the springtime, it really really loads up. You, you know, know where it water. starts? Uh, Mille Lacs? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Yep. It's a real winding river, too. You can take it all the way from Mille Lacs, I think, down to like Anoka. Yeah. And then I think it goes into the Mississippi. Yeah, I can't remember if it's the Crow that it goes into and then the Mississippi or if it goes right into the Mississippi. I can't remember. But I've done float trips on it in canoes fishing for smallies. I did one time uh, floated on it with uh, one of our former uh, voice talent, uh, voiceover artists. You know, uh, she lives near an Anoka section of the rum and uh, took some kayaks out. 
was pretty fun. You know, pretty slow, though. I mean, the, the water isn't really moving very fast most of the time. No, not at all. Soon enough, though, we'll be able to be uh, floating down that stuff again. It's warming up. I mean, right now it's a little bit on the chilly side. I heard we're in for some snow. I still don't see it. I've used my snowblower once this year. Last year, no bullshit, I bet I snowblowed 17 to 20 times. Oh, yeah. Yep. No doubt. No, it was 100 inches of snow last year. Was it really? Yeah, roughly. Was that like a any sort of like recent record that you remember hearing? No, I think it no? was in the top three or four. I was very done with snow last year. This year I'm kind of going maybe a little bit more. I was so done with it, I went to Florida for 11 weeks. Well, you deserve that though. Yeah. You know, in your golden years? <laughs> yeah, that's thing? right. Yeah. Yeah, like the Golden Girls. You feel, uh, you missing it now that you've been back for a while? Yeah, I'd go right back. No problem. No problem. Go right back. What do you miss about it the most? Would you say it's the fact that you're not under communist rule? Uh, it, there is an oppressive feel here. Yeah, there is, isn't it? Yeah, where nothing is allowed. Right. I don't like the fact that, uh, like, they're, you know, like, the elected officials in my state seem like they're not really elected. I feel like they just got installed. I think they're just party members. Right? Yeah. They're just part of the, the machine. I'm done with it. It's all the, uh, like, they're all in in lockstep with, like, as you put it, uh, the educational industrial complex. That now is kind of its own sort of beast, kind of like the military industrial complex after World War II. They're in bed with uh, eco-terrorism, I think. They're in bed with everything. They're not in bed with me. They're not in bed with America. Yeah. America. They're, they're not in bed with bubs and teabag either. They're not a, in, in bed with rural Minnesota. No, definitely not. Everybody up here hates them. Yeah. And I agree. Well, they're just going to become, it's going to be some version of the Hunger Games where it's central command and yeah. then yeah, everybody else is out in the hinterlands. The thing I like in my world is that I think a lot of people have forgotten this too. Hating someone, should you choose to do so, is your God-given right. You don't have to like everyone. And everyone doesn't have to like you. No, I expect no one to like me. Well, I wouldn't say no one, Bubs. I mean, I love well, you, and there's a couple my... other people. You know, there's there's maybe seven or eight people in your close <laughs> inner circle. But I I have no expectations, I yeah. guess, of fairness or love or anything. It's just I think a lot of people have forgotten that they're allowed to really strongly dislike people, and if they want to, even hate them. Yeah, I guess it's if the word you hate, act on it. Yeah, the hate is the I word hate know. gets thrown around a lot these days, Overused. especially when it's kind of like hate speech i'm more like of that. a person that loathes i'm not a hater Me too. i'm more of a loathing hate is not a good emotion to have too much of it can really eat you alive i agree loathing can be entertaining though yeah but hate is nonetheless you know you do have a right if you need to uncap the hate jar for you know once every 300 years or something like that i think that's kind of what happens in history people get pushed to the push to push to the uh sort of ledge or push to the edge they open the jar and then they have a hard time closing it again. Yeah, you wonder where, like in the United States or you know Minnesota's always been somewhat of a populist type state or a you know weird politicians come out of here, different views or what happened to the rebellion of mankind or the United States? The the average citizen was kind of like, yeah, I put up with some of this, but fuck you. Uh, in my opinion, I think that people of European descent have it's been educated out of them over the last probably 60 years or so like they've been conditioned to think that if you're white or european in nature and you live in the united states you're not allowed to sort of take pride in your culture in fact a lot of people say there is no such thing as white culture so i'm cultureless sort of i mean let's be honest I remember hearing these kind of things when I was growing up and being educated myself. In the institutional learning facility that yeah. you attended? Yeah. Yeah. Inside the People's Republic of Education. Yes. Now, if you convince an entire sort of large segment of your population that they don't have any culture and they need to sit back and take it, I mean, I guess mission accomplished, although that probably won't last forever. I think eventually you push people to the limit. They react. But I think that the games that are being played right now, I, I don't know that the people that are playing them have put a whole lot of thought into it. Well, I think in a football analogy, they're, they're, they keep running to the left because they can get as much yardage yeah. as they still can. And so far, the, the right 
defense side of the yeah, defense. Yeah, they, they just kind of go along with it. Well, they can't even stop it. I mean, they can maybe – there. there's no hits for losses. There's nothing. Maybe once in a great while, Yeah, you know, you see something politically. But in this state, no. I'll say this much. If you're from Minnesota and you're white, like a lot of people are, you do have a culture. It exists. So I'm not going to – I'm not going to – about 89 89- – to percent of the state probably with the exception of a large somali enclave in minneapolis that apparently makes our decisions for us now those people have a culture i'm not sure what it is maybe it's wiping your ass barehanded i'm not i'm not sure i don't care what theirs is well they've done movies about this area well you're darn tootin yeah well if you are white though you do have a culture it's not my job to tell you what it is but you have one and if you decide to, go ahead and take pride in it. And if you don't, that's your right to. Well, last year, uh, this past Christmas, I went to a uh, Christmas concert at so, a Lutheran church in Scandia. We talked about this. You went to a white pride rally then? Basically. Yeah. But it was white Lutherans, you know, that are probably Scandinavian or sure. German or something in their descent. And they have a culture. I, I sat there. It's different than mine as growing up Roman yeah. Catholic. I grew up in one kind of similar to that. I went to, a, you know, a Lutheran church when I was younger. I can tell you a little bit what the culture is. It kind of revolves around passive aggressivism. Somewhat bland. That's an art form. Yeah. Somewhat uh, bland food and taking you know part in it. Definitely cream of mushroom is a, uh, a spice. component. Yes. That's a big spice. Big time. That's, or- that's salt and pepper. <laughs> Ooh, that mayonnaise is spicy. Yeah. Watching uh, sporting events that you already know the outcome to, yet nonetheless put your heart and soul into. That's a big part of it. Shoveling is a big part of it. Coffee. And then sort of, you know, very quiet, behind-the-scenes substance abuse. That Whether it's pills or wine. Yep. Any of the above. Mm-hmm. You keep it quiet, and then you sort of point fingers at other people and accuse them of doing what it is that you're doing. I think you're describing me. I, I think we've all... <laughs> That's part of our culture too, Bubs. But yeah. there's other parts of it that we haven't probably realized yet that are sort of bubbling up under the surface type thing. I'm excited to what see those. Mean? Well, if Scandinavian type people in Minnesota suddenly decided to really start vocally taking pride in themselves, I think you'd see some things pop up that maybe we hadn't seen in a while. Hey, all of a sudden you're proud of yourself. Hey, here's a new sport we invented. Look, we're being creative. Mm, you know, okay. it could spark creativity. Kind of like the 1960s with the ushering in of LSD. Open and expand your mind with a bunch of hallucinations. Look at the mu- look Lutherans. at the mu- yeah. Look at the music that came out of it. Well, some of it, yeah. And I gotta say, uh, I had a, a psychedelic experience recently, Bubs. How recent? Uh, within the last week. Oh. And I gotta say, there's something to it. Yeah. There really is. Yeah. You walk away from those things. I'm not talking about going to a party and loading up on peyote or something like that hanging with the boys and slamming beers. I'm talking about actually going into kind of a therapeutic sort of setting, ingesting the uh, medicine, if you will, having your experience, and then taking things away from it afterwards. Yeah, there's some big takeaways from stuff like that for me. Sure. And it's not something that uh, you need to do, you know, like taking a daily pill for quote-unquote depression. That kind of stuff, to, in my opinion, is some drug maker getting rich off side effects. This type of stuff is put here, I think, by God. Grows in the ground, naturally. You eat it. You figure out what your problems are. And then how to address them and move forward. Yeah. Those kind of things are the takeaways that I've got from it. Um, moving forward is key. You know what I mean? Always, even when it seems difficult... Forward momentum is always something that you should be moving towards, in my opinion. I agree. Completely agree. Whether it's a small step or, you know, a sprint for one day or a tiny little step for many days. Moving forward from here on out, it's going to be a no-holds-barred blitzkrieg of topics that you can digest mentally, process as you will, and then put into work in the real world. Wow. Wow. Are we going to go regional first? My, my two, just, yep, we'll start here. Yeah. This is ground zero, brother. So don't go, you know, history being a, a teacher, let's not go into Wisconsin and North Dakota at the same time. No. No, we start here yeah. and, and 
The epicenter is right here. We don't need a two-front war. No. Started in March of 2024, basically, on the 54th birthday of Bubs. <laughs> war has been declared. <clears throat> you ready for war? What kind of war? Fighting. Possibly hand-to-hand fisticuffs. I need to get into a little better shape. So, getting into shape, talking about war, you, you've... I think the Lord or synchronicity or karma works in a very strange way. Last week was my birthday. Celebrated well. Happy birthday again, by the way. My wife makes a cake. We call it crack cake because you can't quit. You're willing to do things for that piece. What's it? I think I maybe had a tiny piece of it before one time, a long time ago. It's a very rich chocolate cake. It's layered, and then she does a buttercream, doctors up the buttercream. That's on top. Is it is well, it kind of like layered. a German chocolate? No, with the, no, 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 no. It's layered. Yeah, there's layers to it. So yeah. there's frosting in the middle of it. How but many, how many pieces do you have? I had half the motherfucker. Good for you, man. Yeah. You've earned it. Yeah, in a two day period. <laughs> it's better than that cheesecake that uh, mm. those little bastards oh. never let you have a hand on. Yeah, I had some of that over my trip on the way back. I stopped specifically at my aunt's place. Uh, yeah, and yeah. She made good for you. Oh yeah, you deserve it. Yeah. So I understand, even though you're not a man who goes down these psychedelic journeys, you still have come to a realization that you may have to go to war, and and uh, you decided this during your birthday, basically, is what you're saying. Well, I need to get in shape. Okay. And I, I started out really well in the year, and we talked about it being resolute. And then uh, I was doing really well in Florida, and then about the last month in Florida, it kind of came off the chains. Not in a bad way, just got... Yeah. Someone, someone mailed you pharmaceuticals, too, didn't they? Did that kickstart the sort of descent into substance abuse? No, not at all. Not at all. That was just a way to relax. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, but when I'm talking about karma, God, or whatever, there's a plate with two big donuts on it right now in front of me. And yeah. some uh, Reese's uh, half... I don't know what are those peanut. Th- those butter are eggs? peanut butter cup eggs. Yeah, for everybody listening, um, what's that? A fritter and a chocolate ice donut. Right. So when Bubs shows up at the studio for a recording sesh, as we like to call it, uh, I try to have things, you know, welcoming. And today he got his usual McDonald's coffee, a steaming cup of Joe. There's a couple of uh, breakfast sandwiches and a couple of hash browns if he so wants it. He did eat part of the breakfast sandwich. I believe it was a sausage McMuffin. I don't think he ate the bread portion. I did not. So I went uh, I went into and, the keto. Yeah, and there is also a small plate, like a paper plate, and there is uh, two donuts from Casey's on there that I got. I one of them is a chocolate with chocolate icing, which is one of my favorites, the the classic regular yeah. uh, cake donut, I yeah. believe. Oh, yeah. Great No sprinkles, coffee. yep. And then we got the apple fritter. Mm. And the Casey's apple fritters are amazing. And then for good measure, I just threw a few, like, little Reese's peanut butter eggs in there because I had them. And uh, the more I get rid of them, the less fat I'll be. Yeah. So it's it's funny that, you know, for the last five days, six days, I've been doing really well. And now I have this sitting in front of me. Should I take it down? No, I'll stare at it. Really? I might huff them. All right. Yeah. Um, I'll put them in a paper bag and just sniff the fuck out of them. You let me know. If I need to, I'll take her down. But, you know, I like to have a nice table here with – a cornucopia of sort of stuff. Yeah, next time we'll have bacon. Yeah, that'll be good. You could eat bacon, mm-hmm. right? You can eat that stuff, right? Yes, sir. Roasted a duck yesterday. How was it? It was good. It's rich. Wild caught? No, just store bought. Where'd you buy it from? China, like <laughs> China store on the corner type thing, or what? No, um, I don't know. It was in our freezer. No kidding! Wow, a yeah. lot of wild game in there, huh? Yeah. So. Did you just kind of like roast it up and, you know, butter it or something like that? Or was there like a I whole... spatchcocked it. What's that mean? What do you mean? What's that? I don't <laughs> get it. Spatchcocking? Yeah. You're not familiar with spatchcocking? Not even close. All right. That's where you cut the vertebrae out, the backbone, and okay. lay it flat. Really? On a grate. So okay. you can do that to chicken, do it to any poultry. So you had a whole duck in there with the bones in it and everything. Oh, still. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You don't just breast it out. No. And then flatten it. Wow. Season it. Yeah. Tasted good, huh? It wasn't as crispy as I like. Man, I don't know if I'd be able to sit down and eat a duck. It's rich meat. It sounds wild. I mean, I've had it. My buddy Larry, uh, a couple years ago, I went duck hunting with him once. I'm not much of a duck hunter. I fire way too early, (laughs) which has kind of historically been my thing. Yeah, Yeah, you know what I mean? It's kind of been a problem. Sorry to the ladies of Princeton. But, yeah, I went with him and... 
you know, he goes all the time. Like when duck hunting season's going, he's going crazy, like yeah. almost every day. Yeah. And he gave me some duck like jerky and stuff like that, goose jerky. And it's not bad. But I always seem to taste the water in it. You know, it does have a little bit of a taste Game. like kind of just like a swampy water in a way. Or like natural water. Sure. Whereas uh, the American farmer, he did something called snow goose hunting recently. Okay. And those are per- in the fields. Yeah. They like lay down mm-hmm. with like hundreds of decoys everywhere and these huge speakers like blaring these goose calls. And I guess like thousands of them fly overhead. And when they kind of come in and start to land, you just unload on them. Amber. And and I don't even think there's a uh, a limit. I think you can just unload on them. Did you have some of that? Yep. That didn't taste as as gamey. As but duck, it was it as was, a duck pond. It was still there a little yeah. bit though. You know sure. what I mean? Well, I've had a lot of duck and goose over the years and yeah. it's always the uh water chestnut with bacon. A little yeah, yeah that's you know, how you do the, it. Well, that's what people do at parties or whatever to cover the taste of the it's, goose. Sounds pretty good actually. It's not bad. Not bad. So anyway, you're, you're, you're getting ready though. Basically, you're you're preparing your body and mind for well, I think for, I got, for war against the uh, you know the strong arm of the Minnesota government. I think a, a guy should be able to do a few pull ups and and rock march, be able to rock carry a rock. How march. long until you are ready, so to speak, for the next the kumite, I so hope, to speak? <laughs> I hope the revolution starts maybe yeah. after September. Okay, okay. <laughs> need, you need a need, cu- a, need, a, need a couple months. months. I need six months. The Kumite. <laughs> Remember that movie? Which one's that? I think it was Bloodsport. Is that where he does this Jean Claude? Yeah, I think it, it. I think it's Bloodsport or Kickboxer. It's okay. one of the two, but uh, like probably eighty-eight. Bloodsport was eighty-eight. Maybe it was Bloodsport, but uh, is that the one that has the like Chinese bodybuilder guy in it, yeah. Bolo Young? Mm-hmm. That's a great movie. Yeah. That's a really great movie. Speaking is of, that where he's Frank Dukes? Yeah. Who okay. was a real dude. Was he really? Yeah. No shit. Yeah, it was the guy that left the military to fight in karate and or whatever. Full contact. Like a real story. He, well, yeah. He so Bloods Jean Claude Van Damme, that's who we're talking about, the muscles from Brussels. <laughs> right? J V D. J C V D. J C V D. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Come on. The muscles from Brussels. <laughs> that's huh? what he was known as. So you're you're too young to really probably get into the the blood sport and how you know I mean he showed up on the scene he's like I Arnold. was super into it but I was also ten yeah you know so it was like hey so and so's got the VHS yeah I was a senior in high school was it huge it was not huge but it put him on the map I mean it, for like dudes your age though was that like hey have you seen blood sport no I don't ever remember that conversation we probably just went and <laughs> saw it there wasn't it wasn't like that moving you know and then he had kickboxer you didn't have a JCVD poster no. Got it. But he did those splits on the countertop or whatever in the movie. I yeah, that was, was cr- that was that was crazy. Yeah, yeah. And that's his signature move: is splits. Basically, his signature move is, and forgive me for uttering such a phrase, but well, his signature move is to basically teabag. You know, he he puts his his legs horizontally and he's doing like the side splits. Yeah. And he's doing it. This is a man doing it, and his legs are completely straightened out. Yeah, he has a gift. Uh, he was, I remember uh, seeing that and just being like, how does that happen? And he trained it. He's trained at that forever. I'm guessing. All right. So we're going to go down a road here. We're going to go, take, yeah. go on, go on this journey with me. Okay. Roger. Yeah. So last week I came across, uh, I don't know if it was Amazon, but it was, uh, Jean Claude Van Johnson. Okay. It, and it's a series. It was one season. It came out in 2018 starring Jean Claude Van Damme who's basically playing himself in a way and he <laughs> the premise of the move or the show is that he's a really he was Jean-Claude Van Damme did all these movies that he rec- and throughout the thing they play homages sure. to his movies and he uh he's a secret agent oh really in in real life in real life okay and the booking or talent agency that sponsors him or represents him is an organization that has actors as spies. No kidding. And agents. Is this uh what what channel was it on? Was it on like Netflix or something? Uh, I believe it was Prime. Okay. Yeah. And what's it called? Jean Claude Van Johnson. Jean Claude Van Johnson. Huh? Because that's his agent name. Okay. And then 
his actor name is Jean-Claude Van Damme. And if a lot of it was filmed in Europe and like Bulgaria, you know, I mean, that's where the scenes were. And it's odd to see him that old. He's in his 60s. So he's probably 63, four years old. He looks a bit like weathered or what? Yeah, I think the cocaine must have caught up with yeah. him. He had a, a habit for a while, I believe. In the I 90s. think so. But this guy, so I started looking into him, right? So the, the premise of the show is he's an international spy. His cover is that he's the actor. And yeah. He, he was in retirement for five years, and he's kind of disillusioned. He comes across an old spy fling lover that he had. and he, A woman? Yeah. And he, okay. He gets back into it, and he's his boss is Felicia Rashad from the Huxtables. Oh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Huxtable. Mrs. Cosby, so to speak, yeah. on the TV show. Yeah. Okay. Who's she's married work- to... She's, she's working again now, huh? She's working again, and she's married to Ahmad Rashad, right? The uh, former... Yeah. yeah, the wide receiver for the Vikings. Number 28. I remember him. I was very young. Well, he had a Hail Mary catch against uh, Cleveland to go to the playoffs. Was uh, Tommy Kramer under the under center on that one? He might have been. Yeah. He, he gunned it. I, re- I watched it. I remember seeing it. Yeah, Tommy Kramer. He about flew out of the house. Anyway, so Felicia Rashad's like the main orchestrator and boss of this talent agency that runs spies internationally. But uh, it's an introspective look at Jean-Claude, or as we like to call him, JCVD. Yeah. And the muscles from Brussels. The muscles from Brussels. And he just kind of – he makes fun of himself – throughout this entire show, the entire series. And there are scenes and references like Time Cop. Right? Yeah. Remember that one? Yeah. The, the, the beginning of that movie is amazing. But that there's scenes in there where Time Cop happens. Okay. Really? And, and then there's he did a bunch of movies in the 90s where he played like two roles. Yeah, he did one called uh, Double Impact. Yeah. that I think that was at the hockey game. So that happens. Or no. Yeah, that might have been the hockey game. I can't game. remember yeah. exactly, yeah. And so then he, uh, that that it pays homage. There's tons of shit. And then remember the one where he was like uh, down in the bayou, right? And he had, uh, had a mullet and all that. Really? Yeah. He had a, one of the mu- best mullets in the 90s. Yeah, I do remember seeing that a little bit. Yeah. Then I remember, I think, wasn't he in Universal Soldier? Yeah, both of them. All Dolph, three of them. Dolph Lundgren? Yeah. Universal Soldier was huge. Time Cop was huge. Bloodsport was huge. Kickboxer was big. And then he had yeah. a couple other smaller ones. but Time he, Time Cop, I remember being like, Van Damme was huge at that point. Yeah. And I remember when Time Cop came out, I might have been like a freshman in high school. All right. And I remember seeing the beginning scene where... It's all these cowboys taking place like during a shootout, like they're facing off like a old west thing. Mm-hmm. And then they draw one group of cowboys draws their guns, and it's these like futuristic, you know, space guns that just blow the opposition <laughs> away. And I, I was like, oh man, that was really clever. That's about the only thing I remember from. He Tom was in Cobb. Expendables too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then he was supposed to be in uh, Predator. He was supposed so- to be the guy. He was supposed to be Predator. Let, let me ask you this, if you don't mind, because you seem to really be oh, up I went on, down a, you're, you're, you're up on your JCVD. You're, yeah, this is like me almost doing a Barry Lyndon a couple months ago. But uh, but everybody's heard of the yeah. muscles from Brussels, <laughs> yeah, right. unlike Barry Lyndon. Listen, all I'm going to say is give Barry Lyndon a chance, all right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted to ask you, the things I had heard about him, uh, he hasn't, I haven't really paid attention to him, honestly for over 20 years i knew he was still around but i had heard he had had problems either financially or with drugs or something like that i don't know how true it is but one of the things i remember hearing was he's kind of notoriously like just up his own ass a little bit i think so to speak and the thing i had heard was in predator with in 1987 the classic with arnold and carl weathers who just died unfortunately and uh, who else is it? Jesse Ventura, a, a ton of like 80s kind of guys. Van Damme was supposed to be in the suit as the Predator. Because they wanted somebody that would be a martial artist. That was like physically agile to jump around. Yeah, yeah. And, and they, then, wanted the, they wanted the Predator, the original Predator character, to be like a ninja. Yeah. To have those movements, to be able to move like that. But the suit was, was too, restri- too restrictive, and then he was like passing out in it. Sure. So he just walked away. 
Yeah, that's what I, I I'm sure that was kind of like his story, but I, I, I wonder how much to it was him going like part of me thinks that some of it is I'm Jean Claude Van Damme and I will not be in a suit. You know yeah, what I well, mean? He, like he, that kind of thing. Like he, it's some of its ego. Like he I, even talked about it right. in, in some interview or something that I read where he uh his face wasn't shown. Yeah, that's what I yeah, see. I have yeah. I had a feeling it was yeah. something like that because I had always heard about that. And then there's one other thing I remember hearing, and this took place in probably like I'm guessing it was mid to late nineties. He definitely uh had been you know, he had, he had done a lot of huge movies at that point, action movies in the late 80s and, and 90s. But it seemed like he was kind of, you know, maybe petering out a bit, like starting to become a little bit of a joke here and there. A cliche. Yep. And the story I had heard was always, you know, Van Damme was, hey, I can kick anyone's ass, like that type of stuff, whereas Arnold wouldn't go around saying stuff like that. And one night Van Damme is going out clubbing, in New York city. And there's a dude either working the door or had a, you know, who the do door, the, you know who the guy was? I'm pretty sure it was Chuck Zito. It was Chuck Zito. And that was his bodyguard for a long time. Okay. Really? Yeah. And he kicked, he, I, I heard that he'd laid Van Damme out yeah, at, at this bar. Yeah. And then Howard Stern would have Chuck Zito on all the time being like, Hey, is it true? You know, like yeah. you really fucking kick this guy's ass. And he was basically, I think like, well, I didn't really kick his ass, but he was out of line, and I fucking decked him. Yeah, you know. Well, he he uh, Chuck Zito was screwing his ex wife or or something. Started doing that. No kidding. And so Van Dam had some issues with him, and then went and talked shit to him at Scores. Was it at Scores? Really? Yeah. And then uh, uh, he was talking shit to some other bouncer, and then that bouncer told Chuck, and then Chuck went over and I think knocked him out. Yeah, and. And Zito, as far as I know, um, Hell's Angel. He, yeah, he, like he's no small guy in his own right. But he was in some of his movies. Zito was in a couple of Van Damme movies. Yes, really. Yep. Interesting how that sort of transpires. A woman gets in between all of it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Zito's, as far as I know, he was just kind of a big, like weightlifter, Hell's Angels dude. And I don't know. I'm sure he had a fighting background, but a lot of it was probably based on experience. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not spending time in but, a dojo doing the splits. But Van Dam in the seventies joined karate or something. His dad signed him up when he was twelve, and then immediately rose. Like by the time he was eighteen, he was competing, representing Belgium in karate, and then he got into full contact karate and kickboxing in the late seventies. So, do you think he actually did legitimate full contact kind of yeah. what they call no holds barred type fighting? Yeah. There's a record of it somewhere. Yeah, huh? there is. No There's, kidding. Yeah, he was like 20 and 1 or something. I don't know a whole lot about that stuff. Yeah, I don't but either. I, but I, it was popular when I was younger. I read about uh, a little bit, you know, about it. Kung Fu Ooh. movies, as you know, you say, and Kung Fu magazines. And, it was huge. And throwing stars and throwing yeah. knives and nunchuckers. Butterfly knives. All that shit was huge when I was in 6th, 7th, 8th. Yeah. You know, and even through high school. That was a little before my time, but so I Jean definitely Claude, remember the JCVD stuff. He ca capitalized on that, and his he did some like part time role. He ended up like he has a similar parallel story to Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he was athletic, he competed, he was from Europe. Yeah, he was a foreigner. He's in shape and decided he moved to fucking uh, L.A. Started working uh, like in restaurants, and then ended up as a, a stunt guy with Chuck Norris. And, okay. and became friends with Chuck Norris and became a sparring partner to Chuck Norris. And that's how he kind of gets his foot in the door for yeah, Hollywood? Yeah, and then he's uh, like a stunt coordinator and helps out with stunts on a couple Chuck Norris early 80s movies, and then that gets him into the movie scene. And in 1985, he's in some low-budget first something, let's see, No Retreat, No Surrender, Kickboxing, no Kung kid, Fu movie. Yeah. And then the big one was Bloodsport in 88. Yep. But so he, you know, I mean, he, think about it. He comes from Belgium. Yeah, he's, he's like a title holder in karate. He's a bodybuilder. You know, I mean, what it was the bodybuilding in Belgium like? I don't know, but whatever weight class he was. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he, he was. He was that. built. Yeah, he yeah. wasn't super bulky or anything like a Mister Olympia, but he was. I don't know what he looked he, like. He was, in 1977, he was proportioned. You know, right? Seventy-eight, seventy-nine, whatever he weighed. You, you didn't know? do a deep dive and check out his physique in his no. early early years. No, I have a hard time believing that, Bubs. Just quietly alone. I was yeah, trying right. to do the splits. <laughs> But he is a guy that's, you know, interwoven in the fabric of entertainment and action movies. 
Undeniably, yeah. Yeah. Especially in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. You know, he, he was like, I mean, next to Arnold, that was kind of the guy. Uh, a guy. Yeah, he was one of the guys. He was, he had something that set him apart from Arnold too, though, in that he was really like a martial arts expert type thing. The only yeah. one I could see that was a little bit different would have been like a Steven Seagal. And Whoa. Seagal, you know, he had a real presence and his movies were coming out around the same time, but Seagal wasn't like known as this athletic body. In no, fact, if, no. if you watch Seagal, there's YouTube compilations of him running where it's just him running in like his movies and they really try hard not to show that happening because he's not very athletic. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, there's other things of him where he's, you know, doing karate quote unquote demonstrations you know, with his Aikido stuff and <laughs> he's throwing these guys and it's later on in his life, dude, he's, he's a, like his ego is un, insanely large. I think you have to have that ego though. Look at Arnold. If you watch anything on him or, or li- Jean yeah, Claude. Arnold's likable. You yeah. Know? But Arnold Seagal was not, is I, just a fucking dick. Yeah. He's a dick. He's over the top. Yeah. You know. Um, and he carries him himself as this like, Hey, I'm a Zen master type thing. And maybe he is, but. Maybe he works for that agency and he's really a spy. Maybe he is. You know. All I know is this. You you want to see some very funny movies. Watch any Steven Seagal movie that's been released in the last 10 years. I don't know if I'd waste my time. I remember when he they're came so, on the scene. They're so bad. They're, dude, they're made on like an iPhone. Mm-hmm. And it's the director is like, <laughs> it's it's me. You know what I mean? And somehow Seagal is getting a couple hundred grand for the movie. Sure. Bruce there is Tangent. a monument to him. Where? Brussels? Uh, it's outside of Brussels somewhere in like. I don't know, Anderlecht or something, Belgium, where okay. it's him doing the splits. No shit. Yeah, Is so, it really? Yeah, it's a statue of him doing the splits. And in this show, Man, I could think Jean of a million Claude ways Van, to vandalize that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure it has been. Johnson, he's cleaning it. Really? Yeah, he's like down <laughs> low. You know, the character's real low, and he's hiding, and he's in disgruntled and all this stuff. And he's out there because of his ego. Polishing the statue. Yeah, yeah. And there's a scene where two girls, college-age girls, show up. And they want to say, hey, can you help us with a picture? And so he's trying to do a selfie with them in front of the statue. And they're like, no, no, we just want a picture of that architect- <laughs> architecture over there. Oh. <laughs> but he, that, he plays. That had to kill him. Yeah, but he plays up his his ego. You know, So he's mocking his That's ego. good, because I yeah. bet 30 years ago he would have never done something no, like that. No. You know? Well, um, the cocaine prevents that. You know? Do they... Do they touch on that, like the guy used to like party too hard or something, or no? No, not really. Okay. Womanize maybe, but not yeah. party hard. They don't mention any of that. But he uh, he did some other thing called J- JCVD, like in 2008, where it's an introspective type series or, or a movie on him where he did it. It's like an independent film. How did you watch it? No, I did not watch it because I limited on a. There's only so much time. Yeah, there's only so much <laughs> JCBD you could take in. Yeah, and uh, but I was reading about it, and then some people were even talking. He deserves an Oscar for how vulnerable he was. Really? Yeah. So I don't know. That was probably written by him somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Yep. Through a few different. But this aliases. this series on Prime was done by R- Ridley Scott. Not bad, huh? Yeah, so it's wow. it's even filmed like an '80s '90s action film. Really? So there's he mocks himself where they talk about, well, you only fight people one at a time, you know, and he's like, it's okay, you know. And then <laughs> later on, he's there's like 20 dudes that want to line up to fight, and they're gonna fight him, and all they have to do is rush him. Yeah. But then the one <laughs> they, the leader the leader goes fight him one at a time, otherwise we're gonna get confused. <laughs> <laughs> No kidding, yeah. man. That's funny. Yeah. So um, if you can, and then the way it's filmed, you know, they, it, it's. I was watching it and I didn't realize they were playing homages to his old movies, and then I was like, "Fuck, this is from this movie." Yeah. This is, you know, so whatever. It was entertaining. It's a little slow. Uh, there's too many close-ups of Jean Claude being yeah. introspective. Right. <laughs> but he he grew up in sitting an or- there thinking on a beach or something like that with a beer bottle in his hand and just where did my life go yeah <laughs> apparently he has something for uh pop tarts because really he's, yeah he's eating pop tarts all the time wow and then uh his character is an orphan right okay and then he claims that so he had a ma- uh, a fake uh fantasy world that he created at the orphanage about growing up on an emu farm with his grandpa okay so it's just bizarre wow. weird shit yeah, yeah. He really, uh, 
Maybe he had a psychedelic experience at some point. Who knows what happened to that dude? But, you know, I mean, he had a pretty good run. I would, yeah, I would say so. I mean, mean, if he were to die tomorrow, you know, he would be able to say, hey, I had an interesting, interesting, over 30 movies. Full life. Yeah. Over 30 movies, plus TV, commercials. And a lot of life experience and stories. Yeah. I can imagine, like, what it, you know, if you met Chuck Norris in the late 70s or whatever. Well, he was huge. He, yeah. And that guy's still around. He's got to be 90. Yeah. And he's in like great shape still yeah. too. Well, what's his machine? I'm trying to remember. The wasn't it like Christy the, Brinkley. wasn't it like the ab lounger or something? <laughs> something like that. Something where like you can that? use your own body weight on a yeah. incline sliding bench. Yeah. I, I can't remember exactly. The only, the machines I really remember were that one a bit with Brinkley. And then I remember obviously Thighmaster. Well, yeah, that was from like Suzanne the early Summers. '90s. Suzanne Summers. Did yeah. That what about Bowflex? Definitely, that was around. But I don't remember there necessarily being like a celebrity, like like hot woman tied to it type thing. Yeah. I, I just remember it. It was on every commercial break. Yeah. And it was like you know some ripped dude that was doing it. It seemed like the commercial was one of those longer, like ninety second ones. And then it was always just if you want Bowflex. Call now for it's six like Peloton you know, installments. Today, right? Yeah, I've never done that, but I heard it's much more expensive than you think it is when you get into it. You know, because you got to pay for the subscription or yeah. whatever. Yeah. No, Plus, the machine is like three grand or something. Sure. You could just put a rock on and go for a walk. Yeah. Or you could, you know, go outside and do push-ups. Drop down and crank out, you know, yeah. twenty push-ups yeah. and seven or eight times a day. There you go. Yeah. You know, you're going to be ripped. Just Bob's like your man. uncle. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, anyway, to tie it all up in a you, ball, you had a great you had a great time with it though, huh? It was entertaining. Uh, I was entertained. No season two. There just one. Just one. They canceled season two. No kidding. Yep. Bummer. I know. JCVD is gonna. Have I to even looked for it. <laughs> find a new racket, I guess, huh? Yeah. How, when did it come out? About 18, 17. Okay, so it's already six or seven years old. Huh? Yeah. Bummer. I know. But Bummer. he's he's. 10 years older than me, so he's probably 64. Oh, I'm sorry. His birthday is 1018 of 1960. Oh, wow. Oh, no yeah. shit. Yeah. yeah, he is 64 ba- or yeah. 63. Yeah. And then uh, he was in Expendables 2. They offered him Expendables 1, but he didn't do yeah, it. Yeah, I, I bet. Yeah. yeah. No, I can't. Well, unless it's me, I'm going to need, you know. They were going to. Yeah, I don't know. I remember. I thought those Expendable movies were entertaining. I saw the first one. Watch yeah. them all. Really? They're just over the top. Yeah cliched but they got everybody in them with the explosions and everything yeah, i mean it's you know on the gunfire and the choppers and airplanes yeah. yeah they got like well sly stallone and wesley snipes he was supposed to be simon snipes in uh demolition man jcvd was yeah no shit yeah and he couldn't do it so dude if if you watch demolition man i love that movie it's like real life right now yeah taco bell you know what i mean <laughs> but i mean like what do you do with the three shells? You, you can't swear. Yeah, you know you know what I mean? Like, everybody's afraid of their own shadow. The police yeah. don't do a fucking thing. Exactly. And I'm like, wow, this is real. Yeah. We need a real demolition, man. To- and then they, you know, show how the underbelly of society is literally under the streets. Yeah. You know, we're here. It's just. It's out in the open, kind of. It's kinda. just not yeah. talked about. Right. Yeah, the media refuses to say that you're being invaded. Mm-hmm. Um, There's a whole other topic. We'll get into that, I'm sure, at some point, yeah. But, I mean, you know, we are being invaded. and uh, I've embraced it. Hola. Buenos dias. I'm more worried about, um, Canada. you know. You're worried about Canada? Well, Canada seems to be their thing right now is just flat out kill people with assisted suicide type thing. Well, I mean, how many are they doing? I don't know. I mean, the fact is that they're, push- is probably they're pushing it, you know, yeah. is, is what's crazy. You know, they're only doing a couple right now, but. I'm sure there's in, in, 19, in 1939 they were just testing the showers a couple of times. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, the train is behind schedule. Right. <laughs> Your paperwork is not right. in order. Right. Yeah, it just isn't. It's it hasn't come to complete fruition yet. Well, so to speak. all they're all they're going to need is some charismatic leader to take charge and decide this is what we're doing, and then use some military backing. Yeah. To, to crush things. And disappear people, and then all of a sudden we're going to be like, what the fuck? It almost brings a tear to my eye thinking about it, if it's the right man. <laughs> It'll never who, be the right who person. Who could it be? It'll never be the right person. I think it should be you, Bubs. I could be a dictator for a day. I could for... Maybe a week. Two yeah, weeks. I'd, I'd I need, think 
Two weeks. I'd like a good eight months. Uh, you know, for me. Two weeks. I could accomplish a lot in you two weeks. You could probably snap society back in. Very easily. Yeah, in two weeks. But you need the infrastructure. The right amount of motivated people could also snap society back in, too. Say, probably 10%. Yeah. I mean, listen, form a group of 100 like-minded men. Do some training. Form a plan. And then make a quote-unquote list. Well, okay, that's simple. Once but you have what a happens list, happens after that. There's just a reset, and then okay, we're back to. We're, we're not really sure. How at some it was point, in no, I, yeah, no, unlikely. I mean, I think that would take another, you know, fifty to sixty years to sort of reset it that much. But maybe you reset, maybe you lay the groundwork, the tracks, so to speak, to kind of move things in a different direction. Well, I think people just need to find some some churching. And yeah, find some a lot of people do. Find some morality, find some center, find some family, find your neighbors. A lot of people do need church you know, in some way. staring at your fucking phones. Yeah, there's a lot of godless people out there. A lot. And I'm of the opinion right now, if you are godless, go out and pick one. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Jesus. I don't care if it's Allah. I don't care if it's Buddha. They all have interesting paths to their own type of salvation. Sure. I mean, I think it's easy and, to and do it soon. <laughs> violence is an easy answer, but you know, the to well, you get an immediate fabric, reaction. Well, to have the fabric of a society in which our constitution is based on, you know, natural law, right? What is natural law? A right sort of, you know, provided to you under God, so to speak. You well, know what I mean? Not even so to speak. The founding fathers were Christian. Yeah, they were. And there might have been some that were a little more, some that were a little less, but the overall push or theme was. Christianity. I think eventually it snaps back in some way to something like that. Most of the people they're importing right now can't tie their fucking shoes. There might be a few that can here and there, but mm-hmm. most of them can't. Most of them are incredibly uneducated. Uh, Working masses. Yeah. I mean, they can swing a pick or a shovel or something. I was like listening that. to NPR on the way over here. Why? I like, Dear God, you why? Have to, what? You know gotta, your enemy? Uh, yeah, is that you gotta, it? You got to dip a toe in. You got to know Fair what you're talking about. All right. I'll allow and it. Some woman reporting from somewhere was talking about immigration and how it's helping the economy oh because God. they're part of the service and workforce and it's going to give a spike to the economy did you by haps happen to jot her name down no i did not okay that is a great example of who goes on the list you know what i mean take over the airways right no you just you you go down your list with your hundred guys one day when you decide to when you're at the beer hall <laughs> discussing things <laughs> Yeah, and you say, "All right, guys, let's put the list into into actual uh, production." Okay. The point is, is that first step is finding your hundred like-minded men. We're not there yet. We haven't even found ten like-minded men. Mm-hmm. I've only found one so far, and a lot of the times we aren't even like-minded. No. You know, which is good. You don't always want to be in a vacuum. We case may, we- in, case in point, Bubs, you went on a JCVD deep dive and. I don't even really like the guy. You taught me a lot about him today. You know what I mean? And I think if it was two guys living in a vacuum, we'd just be sitting here talking about Barry Lyndon and the Beatles all day, and who wants to hear that shit? I don't. (laughs) I want to talk about the Stones and John claude Van Damme. You and a couple others, yeah. Uh, Well, we have done that today. and uh, Maybe the uh, Descendants. Very convincingly, too, I might add. Who are those guys? What? The Descendants. Um, Orange County, probably, band. Punk? Yeah, yeah, late eighties, eighties, nineties. You're uh, y- you have a wealth of knowledge with that type of stuff. What I'm going to suggest to you is maybe give a Milo goes to college. I think is an album. Hmm. Listen to that. Did you ever listen to the Germs? Mm, not that I recall, but I'm f- heard of it. I feel like they're in that group too. Maybe some Agent Orange. No kidding. That's the name of the band, huh? A band, yeah. yeah. Duly noted. Well, it was great going down that JCVD rabbit hole, as well as uh, what I'm going to say. Talking what, about disappearing uh, journalists and things like that. Uh, once in a while, we go down a tangent. Well, but, maybe some of the El Salvadorians that are coming over the border, we could bring them on the team because they have experience in disappearing journalists, yeah, priests, non. They do. Citizens. They do as well. Yeah, yeah. they have. I mean, if you become they haven't a, they haven't had to do it in a country full of armed, angry, quiet. Quietly angry citizenry, though. And that's the one thing that I don't think anyone's ever seen happen. Sure. Or at least in recent memory. Well, now I think in Chicago, some judge in uh, 
some federal judge or some judge down in Illinois uh, says illegals have a right to carry firearms. I saw that the other day, too. And let me say this. This is one of those things where, from a constitutional law perspective, it's always been there. How about this? As a citizen of the world, right? I'm talking about humans. Yeah. Isn't it natural, and this is what backs up the Second Amendment, to defend yourself? Yes. So if you're in Mexico or if you're in Africa or if you're in fucking Belgium, you should have the God-given right to defend yourself. I agree. And whether it's through baseball bats, guns, whatever, knives, nunchucks, yeah. throwing stars, it doesn't matter how you choose to arm yourself. Right. If you have the right to defend yourself. I would agree. And I also would say this much. I don't necessarily, I didn't read the judge's opinion in detail. No, I didn't either. I just heard it on the news. I'm reacting. I don't disagree with what they're sort of saying there. I don't. Here's what I disagree with. Okay, yeah. Is a person who's not supposed to be in this country allowed to defend themselves with a firearm? Sure. Guess what, though? They shouldn't be in this country. You don't have to worry about that Why are they leaving that border open? Because it's or the, stri- a very si- yeah. a very bad goalie is down there. Think of it in the simplest terms possible. These people don't have the sort of I, I guess uh, strategic fortitude, so to speak, to put something into action like this with uh, goal long term goals that are extremely fleshed out. This is all based on incentives and incentives only, and it serves what do you mean one by purpose. Incentives? Okay. You tell people that are from other parts of the world, uh, Africa, Asia, South America, Central America, who hate living where they're living for whatever reason. Squalor. Yep. These people get word that, hey, if you can find your way to the United States border, they'll let you in. And once you get in there, they're going to give you $5,000, which is probably more than those people make in a year. Oh, yeah. They're going to give you clothing. They're going to send you to a city where you're going to be housed and all you have to know about this is that it's courtesy of Joe Biden and the Democrat Party in the United States of America. You, you want to thank the people who brought you here and got you out of that problem? Vote this way is all they're going to say. That's what they're telling those people, and that's what's bringing them in. And then here's what's being accomplished on their side. And it's as simple as this. Illegal aliens are counted now in a census. They, that's a thing. That was decided. How many of them volunteer their info? It does, well, the census, they'll fuck it. As long as they're going to be counted, the census people will then determine, you know, like. Well, that's going to oh, change districts. Right. Well, there you go. Gerrymandering. Bingo. Yeah. So the more people you can congregate into an area like, so to speak, Minneapolis or New York City or Chicago, once you can flood that with bodies that you can somehow tally, you then get assigned congressional seats. Congressional seats get to choose electors for the electoral college. Yes. There you go. Huge. I've got my popcorn ready. You know what I mean? Sure. I'm ready to watch the show. I'm not yeah. leaving here for at least another 10 years. So yeah. I'm in here for at least you know the long haul for a little while. Well, you'll be on the front lines. Maybe. I may retreat down to an area where it's, <laughs> you know, yeah, where there's I like-minded people and, and crazy people. I am going to stick it out here. I felt comfortable stick it out here. the Florida man. I like the Florida man. They got great stories, man. Monday. Great stories, good style. Uh, you know what I found? Okay, to get amazing off, homemade okay. drugs. Okay, we're kind of transitioning <laughs> out. But yeah, yeah. Is the driving down there right? You know, they dri- they are insane. I loved it. I loved every minute of it. It took me a minute to like accept it. Like, okay, I I got to just get in this. Yeah, everybody goes a hundred. I got to get in the seam here. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. I loved cutting people off. I loved fucking giving the fake. I'm going to get in the lane, causes them to pause, and then I gun it in there. Did you go down that highway that's, of U-turns. that's known as Alligator Alley? Yeah, that was nothing. That's That was a nice drive. But that drives straight. halfway. You, you cross the state if you really want to. It on takes that. a couple hours. Yeah, we went from it's, – it's basically Naples to Fort Lauderdale. I was in Fort Lauderdale uh, during COVID yeah. a couple years ago, and I did the Alligator Alley. I didn't drive across the entire state, but I went across a large portion of it to go down to the southern tip in uh the everglades can you say that again southern tee up mm-hmm. <laughs> isn't that a game you play with yourself it, every night yeah. yeah every night i do southern tip and uh just the tip. and we go to the everglades <laughs> um <laughs> so uh i was driving it and i couldn't believe some of the speeds and i 
I think at the one point I talked to, uh, I talked to big cat mm-hmm. and he's like, I don't care if you're going 120 on alligator alley. Some dude is going to pass you. <laughs> yes, and, yes. And he was right. Yeah. yeah. You know, they must have some real, real bad highway accidents there though. I bet every day that we were down there, somebody getting killed. There were intersections where there's cops or there's, yeah, there's accidents. The highway wasn't so much. It was the intersections. On those stroads, you know, there's streets and roads that are yeah. like mini highways. And yeah. Man, I mean, Big those, Cat and I were driving. Those Haitian a, drivers just haven't caught the, uh, the hang of it well, yet. Huh? I, I, I think it's just people distracted. Yeah. Speeds. I mean, cell phones. You're riding behind somebody that's going 82 and they're with their head down. Yeah. So I pass them. I Good. Need, yeah, I need my well, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you got to get away from that person. I'd say my average speed down there was 80 plus, you know, unless traffic. When I did some highway driving, you know, when it was either trying to get down there, back up from there, or like I said, when I did that Everglades sort of thing, yes, I was, there was no way I was driving under 70, I think, at any time there. I love the fact that anywhere you could do a U-turn and just slam out there and do a U-turn. Yeah, just. I loved it. Get it done. Yeah. It you felt, know the one it thing. It was reminiscent of things that back I'm in the familiar day. with. Yeah. <laughs> Let me let me uh That's basically what it was. Let me say this though from what I remember. I have never seen so many fucking toll roads in my entire life in Florida. There I mean, no, I know there's I, areas, but there's, there's probably on the East Coast too, but the one thing I remember was this. I I was hitting these tolls and you just you go through it. Yeah. You don't sit there and like you don't go and do anything at the window. You just drive through. Yeah. They'll, and get, you. A, they'll get you later. There's a license plate reader and yeah, shit. Yeah. I was listening to a, a rival podcast because I like to listen to rival podcasts. Yeah, and uh, you know it involves logic and garages and yeah. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, that's a good one actually. Yeah, well, we'll just say Sutre. Yeah, and he uh, apparently a, one of his listeners wrote in and said that they left Minnesota, moved to Tennessee, lives in somewhere in Tennessee, and he was commenting on his vehicle registration tax tabs, like twenty bucks. So. His truck would have been nine hundred and fifty bucks. Right? Okay, in in Minnesota, in you Minnesota, mean? just yep. one vehicle. Yep, his truck is nine hundred and fifty bucks every year. Yeah, he has four vehicles, so you're probably looking at a guy that's you know fifteen hundred at least, right? Yep. Down there, three hundred and something bucks for all for all, all four. Them. I paid, I think, a little over five hundred last year for my one truck. Yeah, and that is. That is, uh, that is that is abs- that's a violation of a constitutional right. That that's an excessive fine. Yeah, and they just view it as a fee. Name a better movie car. Can you think of one that's B- like bullet? more iconic? Uh, come on. The only one I can think of is is the DeLorean. No, there's one more. Christine? No. Which one? I'm going to give you one more guess. Uh, okay. Can you at least give me an era? I know, uh, like, once I hear it, I'll, I'll want to hit myself for forgetting. Um, Keep the wheels spinning and the beavers grinning. Bandit. <laughs> yeah, okay. Was that a uh, was that a Firebird or a GTO or something? No, that was a Trans Am. Is that a Trans Am? Well, yeah. so almost a Firebird. Yeah. You know what's interesting? Burt Reynolds. Yep. <laughs> but you know what's interesting, though, is the guy who did all those cars, I think, was DeLorean. Well, De- yeah. Well, for sure, the DeLorean was well, his. But yeah. then I think he also had a major hand. He did a lot of Pontiac stuff back in the day. Let's see. Let me look this guy up a tiny bit here. Well, John DeLorean GTO. Was, yeah, GTO. It was big. He brought Pontiac kind of out of the ashes or out of the scrap heap. Yeah. And he was an innovator. The DeLorean is a silver stainless steel the, car. The DeLorean that was is supposed to be a sports car that was a fi- uh, affordable to the average person. Yes, more or less. Um, the DeLorean is the car you see in Back to the Future that they made a time machine out of, and it existed from 1981 to 1983. The, I believe the name of the model was a DMC-12, even though they just referred to it as as a DeLorean. And from what I understand, um, there weren't any real like from 81, 82 to and 83, there isn't really any differentiating between the models, except in small little details that kind of happened over time. It wasn't like the 82 is different from the 81 in this way. It was more just kind of little things. I think you have to be a DeLorean kind of collector or aficionado to know 
exactly what it is, but the guy who made it, John DeLorean, he was a massive like executive and engineer at, at General Motors, uh, big time. Like he left a huge, huge position there. Why did he leave? He wanted to start his own vehicle. No, he had some improprieties, skimming money. They all did it, but he, he did right. it to an, uh, an extent. People have always said this, that, or the other thing about him, but I don't know that they ever completely locked it down to finding him guilty of it. I mean... Well, back... Yeah, I mean, he didn't get convicted of anything in the late 60s, early 70s when he left. But he... Uh, he, he they were looking him. at him. He was a vice president. They made him yeah. a vice president. He, he was in line to take over GM. He was way up there. Well, he was the guy. They were talking about him being the guy, and then he had... Apparently, he must have pissed somebody off or... That's what I wonder. How much of it was he pissed off the wrong guy, and then they just decided to say, you know what? You're done. We have problems with your numbers here, John. Yeah. Look at There's seven of us that are looking at you under a microscope. What do you think you're doing? He's such probably a big personality. Yeah, he was. He, he had was so big. many things going on yeah. in his life. Like, uh, I didn't realize this, but you had mentioned it to me. The guy was getting, like, plastic surgery long before anyone was really doing that. Yeah, in the 60s. Right. Yeah. Because he knew that having a face that sort of drew attention or, or looked unique was a selling point. I think this guy was always trying to sell something. And well, he, he, uh, yeah. And he does have kind of an interesting, uh, a unique looking face. If you look at his photos, he's yeah, dead. He now. elongated his face, his he chin, kind of, and then yeah. his nose. He has a, he does kind of have a horse face. Yeah. You know what I mean? But he did it on purpose to, and he's a tall dude. He's like six five or something. Yeah, I I do remember reading that. Um, so, yeah. But he he leaves. Uh, but he started his own auto company yeah. in the late seventies, mid seventies. The first prototype of the what was it? DC twelve. DM? The DMC twelve, right? So the he, he basically made. Um, I mean, it 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 took a while to get off the ground. Well, he needed money. Yeah, and he eventually, I think, was able to raise over a hundred million dollars to kind of get this thing going. Well, he got it. So initially, he got money from Ireland. So he built his plant for to make DeLoreans in North Ireland. Yeah, that's where they were made. In Belfast. That's where they were made. And at that time, Belfast was on fire. Oh, yeah. And the IRA and the Ulsters and the Blues and the Oranges and the Greens were all fighting each other. And, you know, England was in charge. And they kind of they, – he made a deal for like $85 million to get this plant up and running. And it was going to be state of the art and the cars. And then he went, he started milking the money off of it. He hired a guy from Lotus to help design the car. And all that guy did was create a Lotus. And then they put a uh, stainless steel yeah. shell on it. Yeah, they used like a Lotus chassis that yeah. was like on loan. And yeah. then they, and uh, from what I understand, that first sort of prototype like concept that I don't even think ran, but it was just, here's what it's going to look like. Yeah. I think most of it was made out of wood. Oh. and epoxy you know that once you actually have it sort of uh sanded or, or mm. shaped or whatever you can't totally tell unless you're right up on top of it touching it mm. but that didn't you know that was kind of coming out in the mid to late 70s yeah and the car didn't start into real production until 1981 the ireland thing is the deal that always makes me kind of wonder i watched a couple youtube videos on them just you know like 45 minute ones yeah and they, these two had different perspectives on them. One was basically how the financing in his car thing took off. Let, let me ask you one quick question, just point blank. Do you think the guy did that Coke deal? Do you think it was legit? Because he, he was found not guilty by basically, they said he was in trouble. Well, in the video, he never agrees to really, he never hands any money over and he never accepts the Coke. He does some sort of like a toast, though, where yeah. he's like, hey, let's, let's here, here's to out. a lot of success or yeah. something yeah, like that. Yeah, that's it. And then they arrest him shortly yeah. thereafter. So even if the FBI was in on it, maybe they came up with a fucked up case, yeah. knowing that it will smear his reputation. Right. How dare an American go ahead and bring auto, auto manufacturing to Ireland under our noses after they told the guy, there isn't room for another fucking car company here. Fuck you. Which is funny. I mean, you know. 40 years prior to that, there was probably 12 yeah. auto. You know, and then they consolidated everything. Edsel and all that you got to remember that in the 70s, the auto industry in was horrible. The Japanese were getting well, set they, to kill us. Well, they, they started putting together... Nobody would buy Jap cars because of World War II. 
you know. So I mean, it, it took them a while. They, to they get started into the buying them in like the mid to late eighties, though. Well, yeah, even the early eighties. But you know, I mean, I have family members that to this day will never buy one because of Pearl Harbor. Yeah. So God bless those guys. Yeah. If only they knew that uh, <laughs> it's going to be a last stand of. <laughs> Like it'll be Japanese and whites fighting like hand, like yeah. side by side. Well, at some you point. know, it, things change over the years. It's, but it's crazy how it changes. Yeah, but it's you know, anyway, but they, they won't buy they won't buy a Honda to this day or a Toyota or right. anything. Or, yeah, yeah, Nissan or anything. No, but that generation in the seventies was running the country, and unions were getting way paid way too much. Yep, you know, just the sh- cars were shit. You know, everybody when I was in high school, you had a car from the seventies because. They were two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks. You know, there's some cool muscle cars. I can't. That's what everybody thinks of, but nobody thinks of the fucking Omega or the Pinto or the, you know, these other like a Le Mans. I'm trying to remember what one of those even looks like. Yeah. Uh, Riviera. You know, people had Rivieras and whatever. But I'd, so my point is that John DeLorean is now going to try to make an affordable car. I think originally the price was going to be twelve grand, which really wasn't that affordable in 1975 or 8 when he came out with his prototype. And then by the time they got to the States and they were built in Ireland and shipped here, they were going to sell them for 24000 And then there was such a demand because he hyped it up like a promoter. Right. He was it, he was great at that. And then they were selling them for 35000 which yeah. is a fuck ton of money. A shitload back, back then. Yeah. And then they didn't the, work. Yeah. The and doors then here, would, here, here's the kicker. People couldn't get out of them. Because the door latches weren't working. That, and then I think the real damning thing, at least at first, was Motor Trend or whatever gets a hold of the car and runs their tests on it. Yeah, the engine sucked. Right. And then that's when they realize, oh, oh, okay, we're we're dealing with... The thing went zero to 60, and it was almost 11 seconds. And the car cost probably $8,000 more than a car that was kind of comparable in that performance range. And that car, the cheaper one, was doing it in, you know, eight and a half or something like that. What? So he's got a slow car now that he's got to kind of contend with and reviews are coming in and it's bad. And and like So what he was trying to do was go public for shares. And he was going to generate a hundred million dollars. And that's what all he wanted to do. So I think he used this company, his vision, his ability to design cars, his his inside knowledge of how the auto industry works to just fleece Ireland out of $85 million. And then he had his expenditures, but he was milking money off of that. And then he was going to go public. He was going to sell shares and he knew he would raise a hundred million dollars off of this before these cars were really known. Right. Yep. And he had 400 uh, auto uh, dealers across the country ready to buy these cars, to get these cars from him. Then he goes to a hotel to meet with bankers and investors and all this shit and then he's escorted into a room where there's FBI agents working undercover with with cameras. And, and there's, there's a, a big du- suitcase yeah. full of coke. Yeah, and there's a dude who like the guy who sort of lined up the pinch, the the FBI informant or whatever. I mean, he had met him like once or something like that. You know, like he didn't really know Delorean. Like he had some intro somehow with him, but they weren't well known. And he more or less was just like, "Hey, I can find a way to raise a yeah. hundred million bucks." Yeah. Well, it was that, or you know. This first round will be forty million. This is what this is worth, right? And I think he just, you know, here's to success. Okay, right? yeah, right. Let's funnel this. But I, I, I. But I, he never, he never handed over, like you said, you know, money and no. So he goes to court product. for, uh, you know, drug trafficking or whatever, and he's acquitted. Yeah, yeah. And and the jury believed he was entrapped by the government. Well, the jury also misunderstood the judge's uh, instructions. They didn't have to be unanimous. They thought they had to be unanimous. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So they had a couple holdouts, and they just put pressure on them. Really? But they, some of them in this interview admitted, well, he was charismatic, and how could yeah. he do this? He's part of the auto industry, and plus he had a beautiful wife. Yeah. You know, just all this stupid shit. I think, um, I think the guy did it in terms of – I think he would have done anything to try and keep his – his dream alive. I think the backstory, or there's some details that they don't cover, and it's there must have been channels where he was talking to people, putting feelers out. But well, we could move some coke, right? Or probably, or, or somebody approached him and he agreed to it, and then somebody went, "Hey, we got John Delorean on the line here. Yep. He's ready." And then they scrapped together yeah, and, a quick case, right? Then let's get him into a hotel room and yeah. we'll see what happens, yeah. type thing. Yeah, and I believe that. I also believe though that. 
there were a lot of people probably involved here with the auto industry. You might as well kind of call it the government because in a lot of way, the government has subsidized the auto industry, even going back to then in certain ways. Sure. They didn't want this guy in there fucking up the works. You know, did he cut corners and try and get things for himself? Of course, they all do. But he was living on a million dollars a month in Manhattan. Was he really? Yeah, when he got that money, even before he got that money from Ireland. So he was he was keeping a a, a real line. Think about share that, of it, huh? A million dollar. He had a in uh, nineteen eighty. Yeah, nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty, nineteen seventy eight. But he a million dollars a month. But he had a mansion in upstate New York or Connecticut. Yeah, he had a place in California that was gigantic. Yeah. So and and he lived right down, you know, in Manhattan, probably right, you know, next to. A Central Park or something, but he he a million dollars a month in expenses for his lifestyle. That dude, yeah, that dude can party, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing he probably you know took part in a little bit of the old booger sugar. Well, you know? it was the late seventies. I'm sure he did. But yeah, he uh, he had a model actress wife, you know, a couple of kids. Yeah. But, and the trial was supposedly like the biggest thing in in the in the world, or at least in the United States, when it so, was going on yeah. in 1984. You know, I remember being 12 years old, riding my bike over by Southdale, and there was Key Cadillac off of York Avenue, and there was a DeLorean in the parking lot, and we all, one know, that was like a showroom type one. Yeah, it was right there. So we got off our bikes and walked over. I remember touching it, you know, and looking at it. And before Back to the Future. Yeah, that was years before that. And you're like, what the hell was that? What was the draw to it? Just the way it looked in those gull wing doors? It wasn't the doors. It was the uh, just, it was stainless steel. Yeah. And compared to cars with paint jobs. Yep. And then it's, it, you know, it kind of had a sleek look or not even a sleek look. It, it was basically, it was a Lotus. It's it had an interesting look for yeah. its time. Yeah. You know, but it looked like a Lotus. A l- yeah, a little bit. It yeah. kind of almost, if you look at it too, it almost looks like some kind of Toyota. I always thought it looked like a little bit of a longer kind of a pacer. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? A little bit. Like it's kind of this like hatchbacky sort of it's thing. Its engine was in the back. It was in the back. Yeah. yeah. So the front thing must be where you put all, you know, your trunk or whatever. Yeah, but then when I was watching this, like a couple of videos on YouTube about him, as soon as I heard his voice, I recognized it. Yeah. It, it, because I remember the news coverage. I, I you can't know, say I've yeah. ever, uh, other than, you know, like if I saw something yeah. very brief on YouTube or something yeah, like that. But I, you I know, didn't grow up hearing his voice on commercials and then the cocaine you know thing and you're like wow this is crazy you know i think the guy probably was looking to keep his business afloat by any means necessary and keep his more importantly like you said keep his lifestyle afloat yeah, but he was a greedy motherfucker but so in one of these everybody videos, was back then though. well if you I were mean, at the, if you were at that in somewhere in that food chain at then everybody had to have well been yeah greedy. if you're up that high but after general motors like these they did a like a documentary on how he scammed people uh ranch owners out west in utah and some socialite from the 70s in la and how she had she was a like a the daughter of a lumber baron and from uh oregon okay and she was worth just millions and she's penniless in a in a uh in a nursing home because Because he he, like and he had a crony right so they don't ever talk about this crony but he has this guy and you watch these videos of him or you watch uh, or you see pictures of him. There's this big dude about the same height with shorter hair, white hair. I can't remember the guy's name, and it starts with an M. But he was the muscle. And okay. So he would he would literally call people and say, "I'll take your fucking head off. You're gonna uh, overlook this deal." No shit. John's doing. Okay. So he had some hired muscle, which came into his life, kind of right after he left General Motors. So then I'm starting to think they don't really go into who this dude is. So was he a mob guy? Yeah. You know, I mean, all of a sudden. He's got muscle behind him. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's one thing like if you're doing the art of the deal and I come up behind you, you know, three days later and said, make sure you fucking do this deal for a teabag. Yeah, right. Or right. I'm going to fuck you up. Somebody's going to call. Yeah. There's multiple people and in incidents where this guy was calling people, board members on DeLorean saying, I'm going to fucking kill your kids. Right. <laughs> do, no. do not look at the books. I'm going to kill your kids. No shit. And they, they acquiesced to him. So... He may have had some, you know, muscle behind him that was at a bigger level. And the only way you get into rubbing elbows with people like that is probably through, at that time, moving drugs, which in the late seventies and eighties was practically a death sentence. Then yeah, you would this, go to you'd go to prison yeah. for a very long time. So I can't remember if this guy was like some sort of or like some type banker. of banker. He was associated up, with some bank. upper level like uh, embezzlement, yeah. which. 
he went on trial for that stuff too, I believe. Yeah, later. and he was doing it. He was embezzling money. He was. Yeah, and he had money hidden in the you know accounts overseas Sw- and Swiss, Swiss accounts. Yeah, he had Swiss account yeah. stuff. Like yeah. like everything you would the cli- every cliche you'd imagine. Yeah. This guy got hung out to dry with, and then he after his acquittal, he was never they never convicted him of anything. No. But he kind of slowly sort of started retreating into privacy. Mm-hmm. And I know that in probably the late 90s or early 2000s, this is the one thing that makes me think when you say, hey, the guy was ripping people off. This is what makes me believe that he was. One of his last sort of moves that he was making towards the end, according to him, was that he was really trying. He was trying to get the car company going again. He was trying to get it going again in the early two thousands, I think, or at least he said he was. And the way he was going to finance it was by selling real high end watches to people. <laughs> and he had these watches that um, you can still see. There is some evidence that like exists where it's like some sort of brochure that he was mailing out to people. And it was basically, hey, if you buy one of these watches for seven or $8,000, you're going to have first crack at the next DeLorean, which never got made. And to add insult to injury, none of the watches ever got made either. Yeah. He's but just that a huckster. Was, that was his last thing, yeah. you know, which reminds me very much of um, that guy. Uh, I, I don't remember. I think his first name is James, and I can't remember his last name now uh, for the life of me. But this was the kid who was in his 20s who put together this thing called the Fire Festival. Oh, yeah. the tickets, Probably 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, the ticket concert scam. Right. Where his, um, his yeah. thing to basically kind of get himself on the map and get himself into big money, even though it was just him ripping people off, was to basically do these things where it's like, hey, I've got the best tickets front row seat to like the hottest Broadway shows in New York City get a hold of me and I'll get you these tickets. And a lot of the times, you know, it would be, okay, I'm going to need 3000 bucks for the tickets and we'll have them. And he would usually try to uh, inflate the ticket price and then hopefully buy the ticket at a discounted price, pocket the difference, and then give that person the ticket. But there was a lot of times where he started getting into things like saying, hey, you want tickets to the Met Gala? Which is this disgusting sort of ritual that these upper crust elites in New York City and Hollywood types go to and perform, you know, some type of weird seance that has to do with child sacrifice. But in reality, what they're saying is, hey, this is just a really big fundraiser <laughs> and everybody's dressed up in the hottest fashions. If you're a blood sucking upper crust leech on the East Coast, the pinnacle, the top of the mountain that you can get to is the Met Gala. This guy would sell tickets to it for like 10 grand a pop. Here's the kicker. Tickets to the Met Gala do not exist. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. And um, this dude would sell them. And then once he had gotten enough money and rubbed elbows with enough yahoos, he then decides, hey, I'm going to start, you know, my own party music, huge music festival with influencers. It's going to be the first one for the Internet era on Pablo Escobar's island. And like everything else he had never he had ever done, when it came time to actually. Never happen. Ha- yeah, yeah, he did. He, did, stranded, he right? didn't deliver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they were stranded there. Yeah. But that's what DeLorean in his later years reminds me of. Sure. Because, you know, at the end of the day, that's what he was reduced to. Is He's still a rich guy, you know, by, well, he had by normal standards. After that trial and the plant closes in Ireland, yeah, he still had millions. He's of course, still, he did. Yeah. yeah but he's st- he, living in New York. Yeah. Yeah. He would probably, a guy like that never goes broke, probably. Yeah, he's smart enough. But they, Even yeah. if he does go broke, he finds a way to bullshit people into making him kind of like rich again, like living off other people. So he worked for General Motors. He works his way up. He reinvents Pontiac, other lines of cars he has influence on. You know, to this day, he even says in a, in a late interview in the 90s, there are things in the car, in modern cars right now, that I put in them. Yeah, absolutely. And then he, he, he hoodwinked a guy down in Arizona that came up with a uh, coolant system for cars and had a patent and he forced the guy basically muscled him in to like sell it to him sell it to him for nothing for nothing for a hundred thousand dollars really and then he forced the guy to buy it back from him for like a million dollars or some (laughs) some fucking crazy amount like right before the patent expired 
and they're the, the system that this guy invented is used in cars today. Today, and, yeah, it's and still this there. guy is just disgruntled beyond, you know, some engineer, smart guy, did it in his garage. But and, he, and, and his idea was literally yeah, stolen. Stolen, but then sold back to him. <laughs> but who held a gun to his head and made him buy it back? Yeah, this muscle guy, probably. I think so. So he does it, and then uh, all he said, if John DeLorean would have stayed with this idea, he would be worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Sure. But he didn't. Well, a guy like that probably is just, okay, I've... Short term. You needed money right now to turn something else. I made my return onto the next scam type thing. And then the interesting thing I noticed in one of the videos I watched on him. So he's an executive for General Motors, right? Yeah. In in their heyday. In their heyday, in the 60s. Suit, tie, he's an engineer. He has a a legitimate background in business and engineering and and a vision. And and he was... And marketing. He was a smart guy. He He was an engineer. He was a legitimate engineer yes he so, could he could build things he so could he's in a things. suit and tie in every picture all the black and white pictures then all of a sudden they said he went on a sabbatical comes back his hair is longer yeah he had the surgery where he elongated his chin and nose he's a new man he's wearing jeans to the office yeah. and he's wearing like he's dressed down beyond belief and you have to think of corporate america in 1967 he got into staunchy. he got into the drugs i bet at that uh, point maybe but he got he had a place in California he needed to pay for, so he was always overextended and he was always borrowing against Paul to pay Peter so he could stay in these things right and live this lifestyle. So he was flawed. Do you think that he's an example of the American dream, Bubs? I think initially he probably was until 1969 when he got fired or whatever. Do you know how he got cut? What he, what they blame him getting fired for? Uh, some sort of production error. Nope. It was all these guys. I guess these executives had side hustles where they would have a part for a car that was needed. And they had a side hustle where that their company, through a shell, manufactured this part, and then they would sell it to GM. Okay. So he had that. And they all understood this is how it works. This is how you pad your accounts and pad your savings. Yeah, he, he a went, little good old boys club thing. He went too far. Yeah, he took and it to so the they next got rid, level. Yeah, huh? they got rid of him. He took that part-time job and turned it into a part-time career, didn't yeah, he? Yeah. I, uh, his full-time job got in the way of his part-time We've job. met some guys like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've yeah. even been guys like that. Some of those guys have the best – their best part-time job is their full-time job. Uh, that's the one thing I miss about that uh, line of work was the, the cutthroat of the uh, side, side jobs. The side hustle. Yeah. yeah. There were some good ones out there, man. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, he's, he's a flawed individual. <laughs> He made probably one of the most iconic piece of shit cars that maybe became ever. famous in a movie. Right. Maybe everybody knows who it is. Maybe maybe ever. Yeah. I mean, I can't think of another one except maybe well, way before my time, but the Edsel, supposedly. And that was well, I that believe, was probably a good car though. It was the naming and the branding. Yep. And s- parts of the look. Yeah. Uh I think that was designed by one of Ford's kids. Yes, it was. And Ed. the other thing that if you look at that car, people say this. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but it does look strange. There's this huge hole in the front of the grill that some critics have said looks vaginal and mm. subconsciously fucks with people. Okay. I I can kind of see it. Right. The Edsel's a weird-looking car. It is. The other one I would think of from this era, and not a lot of people maybe know about it that are younger, but it's called the Pontiac Aztec. Think of the car that Walter White in Breaking Bad drives oh, okay. in the show Breaking Bad. See, those were all a dime a dozen. Every every company had a car that looked exactly like that. The Aztec was around for a couple years. Yeah. It's like this weird sort of hybrid sport utility crossover thing before they kind of existed a little bit. Yeah. And it's ugly. In a weird way, but I think it's one of those things where if you could get one now mm-hmm. that was in really good shape, it's at least 10 years old now, but hadn't been driven a lot, I'd hang on to it, empty all the fluids and is store this, it. Is this an investment? Store that yeah. fucker. Okay. Yeah, that's one of those ones where it's like, I'm going to put it away for 20 years and see it. I'm yeah. going to take the cloth off, you know, then. and There are still new DeLoreans because they made, what, 4,000 of them? I, he I was going to try to do seven thousand, I think, and they only got to four thousand. I Something heard. Like that. I heard that. I mean, there are still that are well over a thousand that are roadworthy. You can buy one sure. right now that works. It may not work the greatest, but it works. 
if you were to find a deal on one, I bet you could find one somewhere in the forty thousand dollar range. I bet less. Maybe, Maybe. depending on how like kind of clunky it is. Yeah. But and, apparently, I was looking online, and I don't know. I can't remember the date of when this was posted, but there's still some that were brand new, like never been driven from that inventory in Ireland. Yep. And I believe um, I've seen some literature on like ads that where it was, you know, approaching the late eighties or something like that. And some company had bought the remaining stock from the DMC thing. And it was like in Ohio. And they were basically saying like, there's a ad for it um, saying, Hey, we bought all the stock of the unused, you know, unclaimed or unsold DeLoreans. And right now we're letting them go for 13 grand less than what the sticker price was. So you could buy a DeLorean for like 17 K after they had gone under. I think it would be a novelty and something. As, That's you it. Know, if you're a collector. Yep. And then some dude in like the mid two thousands, an American bought the logo rights as well as all the uh, sort of parts and everything else that still existed and there's a market. There are guys that still drive DeLoreans. There's one that's it's like uh, a club every summer that's parked two blocks from my parents' house. Still, still to this day. Huh? Yeah, I remember seeing one 25 years ago when I was working in South Minneapolis for uh, in, in a trade, and it was around the 38th and Pillsbury area. And I remember just seeing it parked out on the street like it was any other car. Sure, you know what I mean, and it. In performance wise, that's exactly what it is. It's just any other it's piece just of shit. Another car with yeah. stainless steel instead. It's a piece of shit. It is. Yeah. I bet it. I mean, that Motor Trend thing really fucked it. Maybe we should try to get one, and then we'll just yeah. custom plates. I would love to. Tea bags. <laughs> Tea bagging as the license yeah. plate. Just yeah. bagging, bagging, yeah. bagging. I'd like to drive one. I never. And that could be the official car of the show. Of the show. Then yeah. when we show up for engagements, that's that's what we arrive in and take our equipment out of the back yeah. and it or the front. And even though it looks like you imagine hearing the motor, you know, yeah. in it when you pull up, just sounding like a 1983 Honda Accord, just. <laughs> bang. That's that's the DeLorean right there. Nothing but. Well, they should just put a high performance engine in the back. They did so. Here's the other problem with the well, dude. The suspension. It, well, right. He he would do it. after that article came out. He tried to correct course a little bit, but he he waited too long. Mm. He should have immediately gone into hey, we need to beef this thing up. Like next line of cars that yeah, comes his, up. His main concern was the money. It wasn't the car. Yeah, he ended up contracting some other like third party to try and beef up the DeLorean's engine, and this legitimate car manufacturer or car. Uh, it was a company that basically did fits on the car. You know, they would improve cars. Sure. He contracted with this company to come up with a turbo DeLorean, and they made a couple with twin turbo engines and a couple with regular turbo engines. And it was a fucking beast. It was doing like, you know, zero to 60 in, you know, six seconds or something like that. DeLorean was so like impressed with it that he said, hey, screw this we're gonna start putting these engines in the car but he got pinched this yeah. is like around 83 when well that destroyed him when he got yeah pinched. and yeah. he had the right idea if you could have started that thing with performance stuff already in the car to begin with maybe it would have worked a little better well, but so i mean he just made, he made a dog shit car that looked cool it, he made a dog shit car spun it up talked a big game and his goal was to get it publicly traded his stocks and that would have been the money because he would have siphoned it all off yeah and taken you know 70 percent and then let the other rest yeah. of it go to the company if he would have been a car nut and an aficionado he knew what it took to build a car he knew what it took to have a good performing engine yeah and he threw junk and junk and yeah. junk the people that were working on the car in ireland they were all unemployed it had the highest unemployment rate in all of europe at the time really and None of them had ever worked in car production. The other thing I and heard. And he was getting subsidized by the government. Well, the British government, I guess. Or maybe it was Ireland. I don't know how what the autonomy at the time was. But for each employee, he was getting cash. And so then there was redundance. He had multiple employees for the same job yeah. because he was getting money yeah. out. And so he was scamming the system. And this was just the fancy, shiny object in his slick talking. He's a mm-hmm. huckster. Interesting story to an interesting life. And an even more interesting automobile, in my opinion. 
Yeah, Bubs, if we can ever secure a DeLorean, let's do it, brother. Yeah, we should. I'm on board. Yeah, um, bagging. I don't know. We covered a lot today. Totally. Yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of talk about a lot of interesting capitalists out there. Well, he was a capitalist, but he was a huckster. I guess that's the downfall of capitalism is the the, the scam artists. Yeah, the greed in. takes over. And yeah. and I mean, but uh, in a communist system, guess what? Yeah, they're they're just the leaders. No, nope, that's that all. Are it scam is. of the money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, everybody's scamming somebody someday. Yeah, they're uh, they're force even by J- force. They're taking your money in a communist Marxist regime. Yep. But in this guy's scam, it's voluntary. Yeah, you don't have to give him any money or no. buy his product. Right. Or, or offer him backing. I'm going to side with John DeLorean over the commies, but... Yeah, I'll take 10 of those. I, I will, too. Yeah. And I'll also side with John claude Van Damme over the commies. Well, he um, probably killed some in some movies. Yeah, he probably did. You know, And at heart, he's a capitalist, too. You know, Huge success story. He's yeah. like a smaller Arnold. Maybe someday, Bubs, uh, there will be a YouTube show about the Bubs and Teabag show <laughs> yeah. and how they descended into greed and hedonism in their... Uh, <laughs> Midlife crisis. Yeah, yeah, you know, and they once they got big, they their meteoric rise was followed by a uh, tremendous fall. Yes, yeah, yeah, historic. The fall is more of the story than the rise. I think we're gonna have fun during the fall. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, but talking uh, things that come to mind is uh, DeLoreans, coke, yeah. coke binges. It's uh, weird they're coked up driving DeLoreans. Hookers. Yeah, yeah. I mean everything. Sure. You know, the sky's the limit for me, bubs. Yeah. You got anything else, brother? Nope. Spring is here. Amen, brother. Let's get out there and enjoy it. Enjoy Everybody, the snow. Uh, yeah. It's supposed <laughs> to be coming. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, for listening to us today on the Bubs and Teabag Show. Thanks for talking capitalism, commies, the absolutely unchecked greed and arrogance of the Minnesota local government and its uh, installed leaders, and talking coffee and back to the future. It doesn't get any better than that. I'm giving out thanks to JCVD on decades of entertainment that he supplied for us. Great movies in the late 80s by that guy. And, Undeniable. And, and the 90s. There were some good ones yeah, in the yeah, 90s. Yeah, yeah, early yeah. Early 90s, too. Anything after probably 1996. Yeah, he struggled. Use at your own risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and then uh, give thanks to all those cats out there that are in their 20s that we know, that listen to the show, that think critically. Think for yourselves. Don't fucking believe the hype. That the uh, media and social media and all that shit's trying to shove down your throat. All right, Bubs is out. See you guys.